Hi, welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and today we are diving in deep into chapter eight of Becoming Supernatural. Mind Movies, Kaleidoscope. I had just finished a keynote lecture on Saturday night in Orlando, Florida. The following morning, while packing my bags in preparation for my afternoon flight home, I turned on the television to catch up on the political situation in the United States. It was in the thick of the 2016 presidential election, and since I'd been out of the country traveling and lecturing over the previous three weeks, I was curious about what had transpired during my time away. I quickly surfed through the channels to find a new station, set the remote down, and while halfway paying attention to the TV, I continued packing. Suddenly, a commercial came on that caught all my attention, and in an instant, I understood why we called television programming. So the commercial began with a nighttime exterior shot of a couple's home. As the camera zooms in on the house, the words night number 14 with shingles appear on the screen. When the shot moves to the interior, tender yet foreboding music plays while an elderly man moans in pain at the foot of his bed. His concerned wife enters the room and asks him how he's doing. It hurts, he replies. In the lower right corner, in tiny font, almost the same color as the background, are the words actor portrayal. The wife walks over with a look of despair and slowly lifts her husband's shirt, revealing huge red scabbed legions covering more than half of his lower back. So the imagery is shocking, grotesque, and horrific, and looking like nothing less than a large third degree burn. Well, I've examined hundreds of people with shingles and have never seen anything that looks so severe as the manufactured lesions that were in this commercial. So I immediately knew it was designed to evoke a strong emotional response with the viewing audience because it certainly did me. So once you see the rash on the man's back, the commercial achieves its goal of commanding your attention. So because the portrayal of the rash is so arresting, it changes the way you were feeling from only a few moments before your present state of watching it. So the moment that commercial significantly changes your internal emotional state, it causes you to put more of your attention and awareness on the source of the disruption in your external environment. So the stronger the emotion it causes, in other words, your stimulus, the more you lean in and pay attention. Response. This association of stimulus and response or conditioning is how long-term or associative memories are created. So this process of conditioning begins by pairing a symbol or an image with a change in an emotional state and a combination that opens the doorway between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So in the case of Shingles commercial, now that they have captured all of your attention and begun the programming process, you can't help but naturally wonder what they're about to say next. The commercial continues with a somber male narrator. If you've ever had chicken pox, the shingles virus is already inside you. As you get older, your immune system weakens and it loses its ability to keep the shingles virus in check. By using emotional branding, this is the first instance where the commercial raises ethical questions by telling the audience that the immune system weakens with age. Next, we see the man in the bathroom looking at himself in the mirror and he looks worried, broken and defeated. Well, the scene changes to his wife talking on the, kitchen, on the phone in the kitchen and just can't stand seeing him like this, she says. Next, we see the man doubled over on his bed, palm to forehead, wincing in pain, and the narrator then makes a direct suggestion, reinforced by the same words that are appearing on the screen. One in three people will get shingles in their lifetime. 
The narrator continues while the same words remain on the screen. The shingles rash can last up to 30 days. So the scene cuts to his wife pleading directly into the camera. I just wish there was something I could do to help. Again, we see the man in pain. And on the screen appear the words, one in five people with shingles will have long-term nerve pain. These words remain on the screen for the remaining of the narration, which says some people with shingles will have long-term nerve pain, which can last a few months to a few years. Don't wait until someone you love develops shingles. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist about your risk. So let's take a closer look at what this commercial is attempting to do. So first, it puts you in an emotional state by changing how you feel. Once it captures your attention, you immediately become more open and suggestible to the information that follows. So now that you're more prone to accept it, believe and surrender to this information without analyzing it, if you're feeling fearful, victimized, vulnerable, worried, shocked, weak, tired, or in pain, you're more susceptible to the information equal to those emotions. So you might start wondering if the ailment could happen to you. At various points during the commercial, certain facts appear written on the screen, allowing you to read along. This serves to reinforce the programming. Also, while the thinking brain is focused on reading the copy, the content of the narration slips behind the conscious mind and into the subconscious mind. Like an audio recorder, it records the entire script and creates an internal program. So next, through a direct, literal suggestion, the narrator has instilled fear in you by personally suggesting you already have the shingles virus in your body and that because of the natural process of aging, your immune system is no longer strong enough to take care of the virus. This turns on your emotional brain, the seat of your autonomic nervous system, allowing it to become programmed. Once the suggestions make it to your autonomic nervous system, it takes the orders without question and gets busy making chemical changes in your body that are equal to the literal suggestions. In other words, your body is going to subconsciously and automatically be programmed to weaken your immune function. So in conclusion, you're at risk and you'd better not wait until you contract it. So the commercial's effect goes even a little further. If you've either, if you've ever had chicken pox and after watching this, you think your immune system is weak because of your age, you will decide you have an even greater need to prevent shingles. So you will be even more motivated to buy the drug. So if you happen to be a person who has shingles and you're watching this commercial, when you see that your condition is not as severe as the actor's shingles, you may be you know, thinking and finding yourself thinking, I should take the drug now so that it doesn't get worse. I don't want to end up like him. If you don't have shingles, if you don't have shingles at the commercials end, you may still be left quietly wondering, am I part of the two thirds of the population that is safe? Or am I in the one third of the population that will get the virus? If you think, I hope I'm not part of the one third, it means you believe there may be a chance that you're susceptible and vulnerable leaving you unconsciously thinking that you already have it. So you know what I found most absurd about this commercial? Okay, do you know what I found most absurd about this commercial? They never even mentioned the drug, which means they don't have to reveal its side effects. Since the commercial had now piqued my curiosity, I stopped packing and I looked on the internet for another commercial by the same pharmaceutical company. I wanted to know what drug they were suggesting would alleviate the severity of the actor's exaggerated manufactured lesions. After a quick search, I found several commercials with the same theme and wording, but with slight variations. And they all shared one thing in common. 
However, they were all designed to capture your attention. So in the next commercial, I watched a woman is wearing goggles and swimming in a lap pool. Everything is black and white. And in a twist on the previous commercial, the narrator speaking in an authoritative female British accent, which is the shingles virus and the narration is coming from within the woman's head. Impressive, Linda. Age isn't slowing you down, but your immune system weakens as you get older. Increasing the risk for me, the shingles virus. I've been lurking inside you since you had the chicken pox. I could surface at any time as a painful blistering rash. The scene then abruptly cuts from black and white to color and a man lifts his shirt to reveal the worst shingles rash you've ever seen. Again, the grotesque blistering lesions can't help but attract your attention. As quickly as a turn, as that scene turns to color, it returns to the swimmer in black and white and the commercial continues in a similar manner and formula as the previous one. So first, make an arresting statement or show a shocking image to change the viewer's emotional state. Then cause them to be more suggestible to the information via the change in their emotional state. And finally, use auto-suggestion to make them wonder if they already have the shingles. This ad also infers that even though you might be healthy, work out and take care of yourself, you can still become a victim of the virus, further suggesting that no one is immune. Again, the words on the screen reinforce the message. One in three people get me in their lifetime. Linda, will it be you? If you identify with the woman in any manner, the voice is talking directly to you. So the tone of the commercial then changes as a new male narrator begins speaking in a confident, lighthearted tone, devoid of worry or concern. In a similar British accent, the voice says, and that's why Linda got me drug X. The scene remains in black and white except for the woman's bathing suit, her swim cap, and the name of the drug which appears on the screen in large, sophisticated font. Which appears on the screen in large, sophisticated font. So now the drug has been imprinted in your brain at yet another level. Once again, the ad has created an association between your health and safety and the drug that will protect you. The tagline comes on the screen as the narrator reads it aloud, stating that the drug helps to boost your immune system against shingles, to help, you, to help protect her against you shingles, to help protect her against you shingles. At the end of the commercial, that narrator says drug X is used to prevent shingles in adults 50 years and older. The drug is not to be used to treat shingles and it does not help everyone. Here's the punchline. You should not take the drug if you have a weakened immune system. Whoa, what backup? Here's the irony. They just told you that as you age, your immu immune system weakens and you're at a greater risk for shingles. The drug is supposed to strengthen your immune system, but you shouldn't use it if you have a weakened immune system. Now comes the dilemma. If you still choose to take the drug, you believe the drug to be more powerful than your possibly weakened immune system, the programming worked. What the clever, if not unethical, advertisers understand is that this message is confusing and disorienting to your conscious mind. At the same time, however, they are programming your subconscious mind with the idea that your immune system is weak. You probably already have the virus within you and chances are high that you'll get shingles even if you are healthy. In addition, you are told that without the medication, you are likely to suffer even though there's no guarantee 
that the shingles will go away. Even though there's no guarantee. So in addition, so in addition, you are told that without the medication, you are likely to suffer even though there is no guarantee that the shingles will go away easily and that it still might not work if your immune system is weak. <laughs> Finally come the side effects, which are not side effects, but direct effects. A shingles-like rash, redness, pain, itching, swelling, hard lumps, warmth, bruising or swelling at the site of injection, and headache. Talk to your doctor if you plan to be around newborns or people who are pregnant or have a weakened immune system because the vaccine has a weakened version of the chickenpox virus and you could infect them. Whoa, I started to wonder what planet I was living on. This type of programming makes you wonder if we really have free will or if we're all making choices based on what we have been conditioned to believe is the answer. Whether that's a certain type of beer, shampoo, or conditioner, the latest smartphone, or a pill that may or may not provide relief from shingles, virus you may or may not even have. Most of the time, advertising appeals to lack and separation by reminding you to want what you don't have, desire what you need to fit into a social consciousness or satiate a feeling of emptiness or loneliness. And of course, in this case, if you're sick or feeling like you're sick, the advertiser has answered basically to your symptoms. So in one final search, I came across a similar commercial with the same theme, an actor dramatically suffering for 17 days, the shot of a huge lesion and words on the screen to influence the viewer's, viewer's thoughts while reinforcing the same content. Like the other commercials, this one explicitly informs the public that the drug is not used to treat shingles, but at the end of the commercial, the handsome man smiles and declares, I think I'm going to give it a try. Meanwhile, I'm left wondering why he would give it a try if he already has had the shingles for 17 days, especially if the drug doesn't treat the condition. Now I'm really confused. Years ago, I learned in my training that by definition, hypnosis is a disorientation of the inhibitory process of the conscious mind, bypassing the analytical mind so that one becomes highly responsive to suggestions and information in the subconscious mind. So as the subconscious mind is busy and preoccupied, trying to figure things out, the subconscious mind takes it all in without discretion. If you can disorient people with information or in today's world, disinformation, shock or confusion, you just opened the door to programming their subconscious mind. In this chapter, we're going to learn how to do the opposite and positively program the negative programming we've been conditioned to for most of our lives. So three minds in one, brain, the conscious, the subconscious, and the analytical mind. So by now, you know that when you change your brain waves from beta to alpha, you slow down that neocortex with the analytical thinking brain. And as your brain waves slow down, you leave the domain of the conscious mind and enter the realm of the subconscious mind. So we could say then that if you are somewhat conscious and aware, but not actively engaged in thought, your conscious is moving out of the thinking neocortex and entering the actual midbrain otherwise known as the subconscious, the home of the autonomic nervous system and the cerebellum. So if you've ever witnessed someone completely captivated by a television show, i.e. sports, so much so that when you tried to speak to them, they didn't hear you, it's possible that they were experiencing 
alpha brainwave states, a state highly suggestible to information. I'm going to put sidebar here because children oftentimes when they're watching cartoons, they're completely mesmerized and engrossed and captivated in their entirety while watching cartoons or watching, you know, the Power Rangers or whatever show it is that they're watching. Or the same thing, people who are highly engrossed in, it could be sports, it could be um, a movie, it could be a sitcom, whatever the case might be, but it's that state of being that we're talking about right here. So, suggestibility is the ability to accept, believe, and surrender to information without analyzing it. In this state, the viewer is so engrossed, so focused on what they're watching that they appear entranced and motionless. Nothing else exists to them except the object of their attention. If the person doesn't analyze the information they're being exposed to, they are likely to accept, believe, and or surrender to it because there is no analytical filter. It makes logical sense then that the more suggestible you are, the less analytical you are. The opposite is also true. The more analytical you are, the less suggestible you are to information. Therefore, it is less likely that your brain will be in alpha brainwave state or trans state. So take a look at figure 8.1 to help you understand the relationship between suggestibility and the analytical mind, trans, and brainwave states. So as your brain waves slow down and you get beyond your analytical mind, your brain moves into trans and you're more suggestible to the information. The inverse is also true. So as your brain waves speed up, you become more analytical the brain moves out of trans and you become less suggestible to information. Suggestibility is your ability to accept, believe, and surrender to information without analyzing it. So what the creators of commercials I mentioned earlier fully understand is that the best way to program a person to take a desired action is to put them into an alpha brainwave state so that the information presented is not analyzed. When the commercial is repeated, or a similar one with the same message is played over and over and over again, sooner or later that program is going to enter the viewer's subconscious mind. And the more we are exposed to that stimulus, in this case, the commercial, the more autonomic and automatic the program response becomes. Eventually, We've unconsciously memorized the stimulus and the response is automatic and the conscious mind no longer needs to think about or analyze the incoming information. Meanwhile, the subconscious mind maps the information, recording and storing it like a voice or video recording. Keep that in mind. Meanwhile, the subconscious mind maps the information recording and storing it like a voice or video recording. Once it is mapped in your brain, each time you are exposed to the commercial, it continues to prime the same neural networks, further reinforcing the same program thought and belief. Now, not only can information influence your health, but it can also give you the solution to the problem the commercial is actually creating. So other situations that increase suggestibility include shock, trauma, or a strong emotional reaction. For instance, when people are stunned or exposed to emotionally charged situations, it's common that the brain goes into an altered state. As the brain pauses because of sensory overload, such as a motor vehicle accident, the person enters a suggestible state. So in severe cases, the person surrenders to the shock, becomes frozen and numb, and their ability to think becomes impaired. Therefore, when someone is exposed to an aggressive rash and feels sickened by the images, combined with the right music and narration to create an ominous or foreboding mood, 
the door to the subconscious mind opens, making the person more easily programmable. So if you remember the subconscious mind sits right below the conscious mind. So that limbic brain is the home of that subconscious mind. And it's also the home of the autonomic nervous system, which controls the automatic biological functions that happen on a moment to moment basis. So once thought is programmed, like a servant carrying out the master's orders, the ANS carries out the request of the thought. And if you are repeatedly told that your immune system weakens as you age, and that one out of three people who have had chicken pox in their life will get shingles, the emotionally charged experience allows the message to make it past your thinking analytical mind. And in response to this information, your autonomic nervous system follows the orders and can begin to actually weaken your internal defense system. So for the advertisers to really get their money's worth in the commercial endeavor, it's best for them to repeatedly run the commercials late in the evening when we are most suggestible to programming. Why? Because melatonin levels rise in response to darkness and our brain waves slow down in preparation for sleeping and in preparation for dreaming because our brain waves are moving from beta to alpha to theta to delta in the evening, people are less analytical and their subconscious window opens. As daylight wakes us up in the morning, our brain begins producing serotonin. The reverse process occurs. So our brain waves go from delta to theta to alpha, where again, our subconscious is open to programming and eventually to beta. So if you're an advertiser and you know that the majority of the public is not aware of the subconscious programming, how it works, why not create a series of late night commercials with your desired messaging, accent it with just the right amount of fright and concern so as to capture the viewer's attention and proceed to program their autonomic nervous system to get busy taking orders just before they fall asleep. A good rule of thumb, don't watch anything on the telev television or any internet or participate in any form of entertainment or mode of entertainment that you don't want to experience, not only before bed, but ever. I'm gonna pause right here because this is one of the key reasons why I don't like watching violent films. I don't like watching high body count films. Um, I definitely have never watched thrillers, never have had a stomach for any, anything like that. I don't have that addiction to having that adrenaline rush that you get from those fright thriller, gory, disgusting zombie or whatever other kind of thriller type slasher movies there are out there. It's simply not good for me. It's not outside of you, it's inside of you. So part of my goal and my mission purpose really is to get you to become, first of all, open up your heart. Number two, to become heart-centered. The most powerful beings on this planet are people who are not just abundant, in creating things materially uh, and manifesting things materially. But the people who are standing in integrity by expressing the truth of their emotions and being in integrity with their emotions is the most powerful state of being because now you're being congruent inside your heart and outside so that you're able to speak your emotions and you're able to speak your truth. This is one of the hardest lessons I have ever had to, to learn and recondition myself, especially because I was so, so sensitive as a child and I was brought up with a mother who really discouraged me from being so sensitive. And I don't know that she necessarily, you know, and I love my mother, I don't blame her for anything. I know that what was done to her was 
done to me. So she did to the best of her abilities. And she was brought up with in a very Victorian uh, styled household um, without her mother. From the time she was five on up, she was not raised with her mother. She had these much older great aunts who were these spinsters who never married, who didn't have children of their own, but they raised, you know, several children. And then she was off in a boarding school. And in the boarding school, you know, the nuns and the headmaster, you know, didn't allow the children to really, you know, children were to be seen and not to be heard. So it was a very Victorian, very emotionally repressive type of, you know, society. And for an, an a, you know, an, a, she was an, a, an emotionally ebullient little girl, which very vivacious. She's, you know, kind of like a butterfly where, you know, she's very um, outgoing and so forth. I'm sure that must have been challenging at best. And um, although for myself as a child, I was not outgoing. I was, uh, I was very introverted. I was really, really shy, but I was um, also very, very sensitive. And so if somebody would look at me sideways or say no, or said that they didn't like something that I did or um, what have you, I, it pained me to the point of tears. And then because I was conditioned by my mom to not cry, then I had to bottle up those feelings and I had to, but I'd say by the time I was 10, I, I got pretty good at it. You know, under 10, I still struggled with keeping it and not, you know, letting the tears flow in public. But then I learned to hold on to the, the, that overwhelming feeling of, of pain and of crying. And then I would go into a bathroom at lunchtime, every lunchtime, I would go to the bathroom first and then I would go to the stall. I didn't have to go to the bathroom. The reason why I had to go to the bathroom was to let out the tears. So then I would cry in the bathroom, then wash my face, wash my hands, and then go to lunch. That was like a common occurrence for me. And then I remember being 11 years old and for three years um, I was without my dad. My parents hadn't split up, but my dad moved us from the West Coast to the East Coast. And so for three years he was back and forth from the East Coast to the West Coast. Primarily he was here on the West Coast. It's a long story. He has his, <laughs> my dad's life could be an, an amazing, um, like melodrama. And um, long story short, during that time I was without my dad and I missed him terribly. And I was very, very close to my dad. I still am very close to my mom and to my dad, especially my dad, very connected to him. But him being gone, you know, when every time he would leave and then I wouldn't see him for a month or two at a time, um, that pained me, especially as I saw other people with their dads and then it would make me think more of my dad and how much I missed him. And so I cried myself to sleep every night. So every night when my mom would come to my room, she would come to my room to say, you know, to put us, to turn, turn us down for the evening, turn me down, turn my brothers, they each had their own room. Um, I was always sad because it was just, instead of my mom and my dad, which typically they used to both come into my room, now it was just my mom. I knew my mom was sad because he wasn't around. And so as soon as she would leave, I would cry to myself to sleep. She never knew that I cried myself to sleep every night. You know, in fact, I don't think I've ever talked to her really about that, but the bottom line is that I became, I was like really adept at bottling up those emotions. So that by the time I was definitely in my 20s and my 30s, it was just, it was automatic. It's like I just depress, repress, suppress whatever those emotions and bottle them up and oftentimes never deal with them. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I started realizing this is really not that healthy. And so it wasn't until 2013 that I made a conscious decision. There were lots of decisions that were made in November 1st, 2010. That was like there was a huge awakening for me. I had started this awakening, which my best friend and I started talking about back in 2006. We we're like, something is going on. Her and I have always, um, you know, we, we met as roommates when we were both students at USC. We were roommates while we were there. And long story short, we, um, even though our, everything from culture to religious upbringing, um, very, very different hers from mine, but we became like sisters. 
And so uh, we've been testing the universe and on the playground of the planet Earth. And you know, like from a spiritual and energy perspective, we're like, wow, did you know? Let's like, you know, found out about this. Let's see if this works. And everything from cloud bursting to, you know, starting and stopping rain to spoon bending to healing people. And it all started with the healing of, of people and then seeing the bigger magnitude of how you can move this energy. And so the long story short was, um, I, I became acutely aware that uh, in 2012 that I needed to open up my heart and I needed to, even though I had heard of the concept before, but in 2012, really, it's like, okay, I, I want to live my life with an open heart. I don't even know exactly what that means, but I know that it's the optimal state for any human being to live in. So then my prayer and my meditations and my supplications became, you know, you know, great divine one, show me how to walk, how to live, how to operate with an open heart. And what does that look like? How would I think? How would I feel? How would I behave? How would I respond to situations? Let me know because I really don't know. And so, wow. So that decision was, was made back like November 1st, 2010. And then when I stepped it up in 2012 and then 2013, things went super synchronicity, super, everything was exponentially like bigger. There's things that happened that I could, there's no way I could have done them in my own strength. And I know from looking back now, I knew that I was getting into this flow of that energy and I, and I had an inkling that it must be tied to the open heart, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure in the midst of it because there were so many coincidences, so many signs, so many supernatural things. And my, then my friends outside of my best friend and I were like, how is this all happening? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just, I just know that I'm in this flow and I'm just going to keep moving forward. So fast forward to where I am now and there th make no mistakes. If you look at the research that Dr. Brene Brown has done, Dr. Brene Brown, who you've probably seen on Oprah, she is the number one expert in the world on vulnerability. And she did and has has done and continues to do studies and she's done all these TEDx talks and um, she talks about how one of the most powerful things that you can be is to be open with your emotions and to be vulnerable. Now that being said, that doesn't mean you're going to be open and vulnerable to everybody because the truth of the matter is not everybody des deserves for you to be open and vulnerable with them. Those are only a select few people that earn the right to have you um, be open and vulnerable with them. However, you can, that doesn't mean that, that you can't stand in integrity with who you are and what you are in terms of what it is that you're feeling. And the one thing about vulnerability, if you don't know this, one of the things that she discovered as she was studying vulnerability, which ties in with this, is that when you see people who are depressed and you see people who are um, having shame or have oftentimes both, they have shame and depression, oftentimes they're linked together. And that is a sign of unexpressed. Are you ready for this? Depression and shame are symptoms of unexpressed creativity. Yeah. Unexpressed creativity. That means that either you have a musical ability, an artistic ability to mold clay, draw, paint, sculpt, write, however it is that you are creative. It's unexpressed creativity. As soon as you begin to create, the depression and the shame usually dissolve because now you have an outlet for that. Now, I want you to take this, take a closer look at really what's going on in here because creativity is truly an expression of emotions. Now, I can only speak from my own experience because the, you know, ex 
The best teacher is experience, not necessarily education. I know for myself, when I was a child and I, I was not allowed to express anger, I was not allowed to, you know, I was, if I cried and my mom perceived that it wasn't a good reason for crying, she was going to give me a reason to cry. And so, boom, you know, she's going to hit me and physical pain is a great reason to cry. So uh, I wasn't free to express dislike or anger, you know, whatever food, you know, she was serving me. I had to eat all of it. I couldn't say that I didn't like the peas or I didn't like whatever. Nope. She said so. It had to be her way or the highway. So how did I express? Now, as a kid, I was a happy kid. I can honestly say that I kind of my childhood was idyllic, where I really oftentimes thought I was waking up in a dream that it wasn't real because it was so magical and it was so... My childhood was really phenomenal. So, and I, I wasn't a kid that got mad easily. Um, I wasn't sad easily, but I used my music to express my emotions. So if I was feeling really happy and because I was like really jazzed, then I would play really fun, exciting, jazzy, um, exciting, energetic music. If I was feeling sad about something, you know, maybe my brother and I got into a fight. My brother used to love to pick fights with me and um, he used to, he was an instigator. He was always trying to jab me just to get my attention and, you know, his ADD personality just was like that. So if for whatever reason I got sad, then I would sit at the piano and I would play melancholic, you know, t songs in the minor tones and I would just totally express myself through my piano, sometimes my guitar or flute. And uh, that's how I, it was safe for me to do it that way because I would, you know, it didn't matter what I played, I would never be admonished, I wouldn't be scolded, I, you know, there was only praise for my, you know, playing music in any form. So that was safe for me to express it that way. So, and that might, I don't know how many of you relate to that, to that aspect uh, of, of my experience. If you do, let's use this forum of this, of this video, the comments below, let's, it's like an online class that you're taking. I would love to hear if you had similar experiences. And I want to challenge you that if in fact you find yourself a little depressed, a little uh, a little melancholic, a little sad. Maybe there's no real reason that you're feeling sad, but you feel like a certain sadness. If you feel a certain weight on you, um, we're going to talk later as we continue moving on throughout the chapters of this book, we're going to talk a little bit about energy leaks and so forth. Dr. Joe doesn't talk a lot about energy leaks, but he is fantastic at having us get heart centered and connecting our heart. First of all, connecting to your heart, opening your heart, getting into heart coherence, broadcasting love from your heart energy center, and then connecting it to your brain so that then your conscious will, your free will, and your focus is now on commanding your brain, which is now controlling your mind, which now can signal your autonomic nervous system to wire and fire the appropriate combination. You don't even need to tell it, oh, fire and wire, the appropriate combination, your autonomic nervous system is going to know. It has 140,000 chemicals that it has the capacity to create. It will know the perfect combination of that pharmacopoeia to upregulate or downregulate any combination of your 23,688 genes. Done. You don't have to get that specific. You just need to know what the outcome is, which for most people, it's they want to be healthy, whatever ailment they have, you don't focus on getting rid of that ailment. You focus on feeling energized, being in a strong, healthy, muscular, toned body, um, feeling, you know, a vibration of energy that um, energizes you, that, that you are in a joyous state, that you're happy, that you're excited, that you're, you know, wanting to, you're feeling inspired to run and to create and to do all sorts of really cool things. And so once you have a vision and you're able to add an elevated emotion to that outcome that you want, then the order is in, then the bow on it all is really after the elevated state and emotion is gratitude 
and appreciation because those are the ultimate states of receivership. Okay, so we're gonna go back into kaleidoscope eyes and transed and trans because the kaleidoscope is used in fact to entrans you. So it's just a tool that's easy peasy to use. So for years, I've been thinking about how we're all constantly programmed into self-limited beliefs. That is believing that we need something outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. This is after all what advertising is all about, the never ending dependence on and consumption of external sources to make us feel happy or better. So this belief, which reminds us of our separation from wholeness, which in fact is a lie because we are all whole, but because we tend to think that we are separate from everyone, everything, everywhere, and every place and every time, we have the false notion and the veil of illusion that it's outside of us when in fact all of that is inside of us because it's in your heart space, in the brain that's inside your heart is the most exquisite brain. And make no mistake, I'm trying to become more familiar with and embrace in a more wholehearted, quite literal manner that heart brain so that it communicates to my lesser analytical, critical thinking mind brain. When I connect those two, then now I can be exponentially more powerful. And then I can continue to create using my free will and focus Then I can command my brain to create in that 5D realm because everything is inside me as I acknowledge and I embrace all that which is inside me then I create it all around me. That's what Neville Goddard talked about. That's what Florence Scovel Shin talked about. That's what W.C. Clement Stones talked about. That's what um, Napoleon Hill uh, talks about. Anybody who's watched the secret DVD, uh, Rhonda Burns, um, Wallace Nettles, um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. John Azaraf, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Tony Robbins and quantum physicist, Dr. Joe, so Dr. Bruce Lipton. I mean, I could keep on listing a whole myriad of them, but they all know the truth. They're in integrity with their inner being so that their outer being is living like a noble gas, like Dr. Bruce Lipton talks about. If you haven't heard about uh, that whole talk about the noble gases and how how the noble gases are whole and complete, just as you as a human being, because elements at a small quantum level behave similar to, you know, we're 50 trillion cells in the body. So needless to say, as we behave on a quantum level, we behave in a collective. Make no mistakes, every cell in your body has a consciousness and you want to be congruent throughout. You want to be in integrity throughout. And um, I'll put a link in this uh, chapter eight to um, an interview that I did with Dr. Bruce Lipton where he talks about creating the honeymoon effect, having heaven on earth, which is in essence showing you how to live in integrity, in your true truth of who you truly are so that you can create this magnificent life, not just in one area of li your life, but in your entire existence. Oh, that, my friend, is living heaven on earth. Okay, so this belief, which reminds us of our separation from wholeness, is incessantly ingrained in us through the media, television shows, commercials, news, video games, websites, and sometimes even music. It's a simple strategy, really. If you can suspend people in the feelings of lack, fear, anger, opposition, prejudice, pain, sadness, and anxiety, they remain dependent on someone or something outside of them to make those feelings go away. Another pause button here. Boy, it sure seems like um, there's a huge attempt right now with, as this is being recorded, we are in May, 2020. And it sure seems to me that there are forces outside of us that are trying to instill feelings of lack, fear, anger, opposition, prejudice, pain, sadness, anxiety, and to have us remain dependent on someone or something outside of us to make those things go away. The truth of the matter is there's a great number of us who it doesn't matter what the political climate is. It doesn't matter what the, um, you know, all the madness 
There's tons of madness out there and more of, more of things that are peaceful, good, wonderful, and exciting than there are things that are bad. But when you give a, a greater amount of your attention to COVID, to hospitals, to illness, to disease, to the lack, to hunger, to then you go down that rabbit hole. There's an infinite amount of that when you start going down that rabbit hole. When you start to focus on the beauty of, like look at the beautiful green trees outside your windows. Look at the beautiful beaches. Look at the beautiful blue skies, the clouds, the beautiful brilliant sun, all the gorgeous flowers in the city that you live, in your own garden, um, the beautiful homes, the, the just there's so much beauty that's around us. When you focus on that, the abundance that are around us, look at how the grass grows. It doesn't have to work hard to grow. It grows. In fact, not only does the grass grow, weeds grow too without any effort. And so that's showing you part of how nature and how we do live in a beautiful, abundant place. A place, this is an earth plane where we have no lack of love. There is love everywhere. And when we start to focus more on that, then we become more one with it and it is one with us and so as we embody as we embrace an open heart and that we are love and we broadcast love more and more and more you feel more alive and you start to you start to feel perceive and have a sense not just with your five senses but with other i, I call them spiritual senses and i do I, for many 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 years i have asked for for um the great I am to bless me with even more spiritual senses and that the ones that I have, that they would be increased and magnified and knock on wood, this is glass, but knock on wood, they have been increased and magnified, but I still thirst for them to be even greater because I know that that realm is infinite. And so I want to, I want to, on this journey that we call life, that is but a dash of time from birth until death, I want to reach my maximum potential, whatever that maximum may be. And there's such awesome experiences and incredible things that many people don't believe they're humanly possible, and yet they are. And so for us to even begin to experience a fraction of that, that's what this work is all about. And when you can be part of the key and the solution to another person's life and helping them, you know, relieve pain, and having that be part of their past and then have them entrained into their heart space so that now they start to manufacture and create a beautiful life of abundance where they can really transmute the energy and have the wind beneath their wings really catapult them up into a, another stratosphere. Oh my gosh, if, if I could even play just a tiny part in that, I think that is epic cool. So back to the book. So if you remain in a perpetual state of busyness and are always preoccupied in survival emotions, you never actually have an opportunity to believe in yourself. So now, as a recovering workaholic, that was me. I was brought up with the belief system that you, in order to succeed in life, in order to make a lot of money, you have to work hard, and you have to work around the clock. And, and so um, I was one of those where nothing is gonna stop me from succeeding. I figured, you know what? Um, you know, I, I'm pretty intelligent, and, um, but I know I, I'm smart enough to know that I don't know it all, but I know exactly where to go to get answers to pretty much any question that I need. And so I've always been aware of that. And so the second factor is then work ethic, is working. And so when I first started off, well, I mean, it was no, it was very common for me in college when I, especially USC is so competitive. You know, I, that's a very cutthroat university and I was pre-med bio -sci, So, you know, the whole objective of your first two years there is to have people drop out so that, you know, and they would tell us day, the first week of school, the first day, it's like, you know, make no mistakes. This is a weeding out class, pre-med. We want to separate the men from the boys. That was the exact language that the professors used. This class is designed to separate the men from the boys, whether it was, you know, pre-med bio that you were taking, if it was chem, organic chem, genetics, and those classes, you know, 
biology. I'll never forget my biology class was 600 people. By the time we finished that class, there was only about, I want to say about 375 people finished the class. So it wasn't unusual for half the class to drop out by the first, you know, after they took the first midterm, half the class, or maybe 30% of the class was gone after, I don't really remember the numbers because it's, <laughs> it's been a long time kind of dating myself. But the bottom line is that it's to separate the men from the boys. So my point is that are you somebody who is perpetually busy? Are you working like I used to? I used to work from seven o'clock in the morning until midnight. And then there came a time where that wasn't enough. And I've always had a lot of energy. So I've never really particularly liked sleeping very much because I like being awake, I like being alive. I, I felt good producing and making things happen and um, creating results. And I was really good at that. And I made a lot of money. I made millions doing that. And fast forward to 2010, then 2012, 2013, and that's when I decided I wanted to you know, work with an open heart and to be heart-centered and to broadcast love and so forth. And one of the things that I realized is that if you are there, are part of that compulsion to work so hard, to work, you know, to pull all nighters. Sometimes I'd pull till two nights in a row, I would go without sleeping to get everything done, to get ahead, to succeed, to win, to hit my goals, because I was always really high about goals. And I didn't know a better way at the time because I was brought up with the work ethic that you have to work hard, you know, and work at certain industries that are very tangibles, you know, like, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, banker, yada, yada, yada. And, and I was a mortgage banker. So I worked my assets off to perform and to make sure that my clients got the homes that they wanted and the investors that worked with me who were my clients that they would get the investments that they wanted and um, and so and I was I was never competing really with anybody else I was always competing against myself because pretty early on I became self-employed and when I became self-employed I'd never really recognized other banks or mortgage banks as my competitors they weren't you know I was able I was super efficient so I was able to move quick quickly, swiftly, efficiently, and very cost-effectively. I had everything systematized, and so I was pretty good at it. Never grew it to be a massive bank, but I grew it where I was able to live very comfortably. But when you're working at that pace, I'm like, I was always in fifth gear going at 100 to 100, 120 to 150 miles an hour. And... Um, and heaven forbid you should try to slow me down because I'm on a mission, I'm focused. And I had to be very focused. And I had kids, you know, first one, then two, then three. And then I had agents who were just like having kids, plus loan coordinators, notary doc signers, yada, 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 assistants. difference is that we're applying it in a technologically advanced way to induce trans. So up until this point, we've been moving into trans and alpha and theta brainwave states with our eyes closed during meditation. But if we can create alpha and even theta brainwave states with our eyes open and intentionally expose ourselves to information relevant to our life's dreams and goals, we can reprogram ourselves into supernatural states rather than unconscious states we experience daily. But why the kaleidoscope? Well, for many years now, my primary vision has been the mystical. Each time I have one of these profound and super lucid experiences, they create lasting changes within me that deepen my understanding of myself and my connection to the mystery of life. 
Once you have a mystical experience and get your first glance behind the veil, you can never go back to business as usual. And with every subsequent mystical experience you have, you move closer to source, wholeness, oneness, and the indivisible unified field. I'm gonna pause here just real briefly. I will put a link at the end of this video, a mystical experience that I had recently, which was mind blowing. I'm still in amazement over that. And it's about a mystical experience I had where I actually was escorted into the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth dimension. You can't make this stuff up. Check out the video at the end of this particular, of this chapter. So the good news is that mystical experiences are no longer relegated to people like Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi, or a Buddhist monk who's been meditating for 40 years. Every person is capable of engaging, experiencing, and accessing the mystical. Yes, my friend, you, as well as me, if you're breathing, you pass the mirror test, it's accessible to you, and it won't take that long for you to accomplish it. So when I'm having a mystical experience, it seems more real to me than anything I've ever known in my life. And I lose track of space and time. You just don't feel time in that dimension. So often, just before I become entwined in it, I see in my mind, and sometimes in my outer world, circular geometric patterns made of light and energy, and they tend to look like mandalas, except they're not static. They're standing waves of interfering frequencies that appear, they appear as fractal patterns. The only way I can describe their properties is that they are alive, moving and changing, and ever evolving into more complex patterns with patterns. So it's like a pattern inside a pattern inside a pattern, just like a kaleidoscope. So these patterns look like what you see when you look into a kaleidoscope, but instead of being two-dimensional, they are three-dimensional. When I see and rest my attention on these divine geometric patterns, they change. And I know in a moment as my brain takes the pattern of information and transduces it into a vivid imagery, I'm about to have a profound mystical experience. That's why my team and I wanted to create a kaleidoscope visual for my students to hopefully induce those type of experiences, but we couldn't find any real footage of a kaleidoscope. So at the time, all fractal geometric media files on the internet were computer generated, and I wanted to create a more realistic representation. So after much searching, my team and I found a family that has been making kaleidoscopes for three generations. So we bought one of their best pieces. So next we rented a camera by RED, which is one of the top of the line cameras they use in the film industry. The leading manufacturer of the professional digital cinema cameras, most often used in Hollywood films. We fitted the camera with a lens that attaches to the end of a fiber optic filament, which we inserted inside the kaleidoscope. Once we placed the camera inside the kaleidoscope, we affixed a motor to the end that rotates so its internal crystals and oils would move smoothly and in consistent transitions. So for hours in a Seattle, Washington studio, we captured beautiful images and colors while filming against a black backdrop. The black represents the absence of anything physical, the place where we become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time. This is the infinite black space or void that you learned about in chapter three. So as we recorded all the footage over the course of several days, gravity caused the crystals and oils to fall and accelerate with every rotation. So a technician had to tediously account for every second frame by frame to ensure the transitions were smooth. So if the transition was not fluid, it risked breaking the viewer's focus or trans state. So it took months to refine our footage into the one hour video that we used during our advanced workshops. So finally, we had talented composer Frank Pischiotti, might be Pischiotti, I'm not sure how that's pronounced to be honest, but finally we had talented composer Frank Pichotti created the accompanying soundtrack. 
We wanted our students to be continuously mesmerized by the beautiful symmetry and changing geometric forms. Okay, next, mind movies, the motion picture of your future. At our advanced workshops, every participant receives a fun and easy to use software program called Mind Movies to make a movie about their future self and their life. So we use this in tandem with the Kaleidoscope video. Depending on what the student wants to create in their life, the movie they make about their future exposes them to images and specific written suggestions and information designed to assist them in creating it, just like the Shingles commercial helps you to read along. So this could range from healing from a disease to strengthening their immune system, to creating a new job, manifesting new opportunities, traveling the world, attracting abundance, finding a new life, partner, having mystical experiences, and more. Speaking of that, one of my dreams is I got to travel a lot last year. In fact, I was, I was mostly out of the country last year. But one of my dreams is with my divine right spirit mate, you know, whoever the man of my dreams is, to travel the world, to do like at least a year, year, year and a half, maybe even two years. You know, there's 198 countries. I don't necessarily want to go to all, all 198, but I would like to probably do maybe at least 130 of the countries that exist on this planet. I think what an awesome experience it would be to travel around the world you know, with that special person so that you can share all these really cool experiences and see all these different cultures and languages and the nuances of, um, there's a lot of mystical places around the planet and just gorgeous nature. And I, I'm just such an island girl. I love the beaches from all over the world and you see different types of dolphins and whales. Oh my gosh, I, when I was in Alaska last year, I was able to see bubble netting, which the, it's the only place on the planet where whales have this particular type of behavior. And as my magical life would have it, of course, it's the first time my captain said he had ever seen it. Uh, and he, he said that he's read about it in textbooks. And there was another gal that was a biologist who was on the boat who um, she said she'd read about it, but they were like blown away that we were able to witness this group of whales, I think there were, I'll have to look at the footage again, but they're either nine, 10 or 11 whales. And there were these older whales that were teaching these younger whales how to bubble net. And so for about two hours, we were able to follow them and you would see the spouts. It was, it was like, I bet you I can synchronize some sort of music to those whales because you would see one blowhole, two blowhole, three blowhole, four blowhole, five blowhole, six, seven, eight. It was like a beautiful natural fountain. Based on that, you would know where the whales were. And then shortly thereafter, they dive in deep into the waters. And the next thing you know, you see this circle of pretty fair, you know, they're fairly large bubbles. You can't miss them. And so it was like incredible to experience this bubble netting effect that these whales are teaching the younger whales and they use bubble netting to fish so that they can capture fish. And um, so this is all uh, something that, that we can experience. And so I want to experience more things like that in different parts of the world, you know? So moving on here, I'm going to get carried away with my because I know that that's going to happen. That's, I already put it in my meditation, the order's in, it's a done deal. And now it's just, a, when is it going to happen? I don't know, but I know it's going to pop into my, ex, into my experience at the most unexpected time, and it's going to be awesome. Okay. So where, where were we? So this could range, I'm just going to reread the section. This could range from healing from a disease to strengthening their immune system, creating a new job, manifesting new opportunities, traveling the world, attracting abundance, finding a new life partner, having mystical experiences, and more. Its purpose is to remind them that they can accomplish their dreams, create the uncommon, and become supernatural. The goals of this personalized media presentation include helping students get clear on the intention they want to create in their future and programming their conscious as well as their unconscious mind into a new future. 
Changing their brain and body to biologically look like the future has already happened, and repeatedly associating those pictures and images with music to create new neural networks in the brain and to emotionally recondition the body to a new mind. It's a way for them to remember their future. So the Mind Movie technology was founded by two business partners from Australia, Natalie and Glenn Ludwell. They are not only the founders, but also the poster children for its capabilities. Their journey began in 2007 when a friend showed them a movie he had created about his life. Later, he approached them with the idea of starting a business based on what would then become Mind Movie software. Getting the business off the ground required them to create a website to distribute the software so they could instruct people from all over the world on how to make their own mind movies. Yet they already had four businesses and knew almost nothing about internet or e-commerce. So Glenn could barely turn on a computer and Natalie hadn't even heard of YouTube. 2007, who hasn't heard of YouTube in 2007? I think that's nuts. Anyhow, they recognized, however, that Mind Movie had the potential to be a very powerful tool to help people build the belief that they could create real outcomes in their lives. So it's basically a vision board, but it's a movie instead of a 3D, you know, flat pictures. With that in mind, they decided to post a video about the power of Mind Movies on YouTube. At the end of the video, viewers were encouraged to visit their website where they could learn how to build their own mind movie. So in early 2008, after receiving countless emails from customers telling them how mind movies had changed their lives, Natalie and Glenn decided to go all in. They flew to the United States, attended an internet marketing seminar, joined the marketing mastermind group, and began planning mind movies global launch. Yet when they arrived in the United States, they had nearly drained their bank account, leaving almost no money to pay for the remaining services required to launch the business. This meant learning, mastering, and implementing everything for the launch themselves. So for months, they worked 12-hour days out of their office, otherwise known as their bedroom. In the process, they ventured so far outside of their comfort zone that they no longer knew what a comfort zone was. Faced with daily technical issues, business and personal challenges, they had one secret weapon in their arsenal, their own mind movie. So in their mind movie, Natalie and Glenn defined the number of customers they wanted to attract and who those customers would be. They described the respect of their industry peers and plotted out what they would do once their business was a success such as the restaurants where they would eat and the family holidays they would take. Finally, they would want to produce a $1 million worth of sales. So they wanted to produce $1 million worth of sales. Why not aim high? They thought their marketing friends were doing million dollar launches, albeit with $5,000 programs. They watched their mind movie multiple times a day to de-stress and remain focused and inspired, even though everything in their current reality seemed to be working against them. So, but they knew all their effort, risk, and dreams would culminate on the day of their global launch. So the finish line was in sight, and then the unthinkable happened. Scheduled for September 2008, their launch coincided with the global financial crisis. Pause button here. I know for a fact I was working in the mortgage banking industry, August 2008. Um, and I had predicted that this was going to happen because I know that Warren Beckwith likes to buy low and he likes to sell high and um, he loves tax credits. So we saw that Countrywide was, they were losing money like crazy. And we also saw, uh, Mozilla, who was the CEO of Countrywide at the time, he started unloading a year before we noticed that he was routinely, like every month, he was selling stock from Countrywide, which kind of signaled to us, it's like, why, you know, we've got all this refi boom kind of going on. Why is he selling so much stock? Yeah, you know, the stock is high, but 
he's like unloading all of this stock kind of made me think it's like maybe he's stepping down from the board, which he did step down from the board. Um, but in August, Mozilla was out. And then one, it had been announced that one in six mortgages in the United States was in default. Well, that's a lot of, that's, you know, almost 20%, about 17, 18% of the population who has, actually one in six mortgages was held by countrywide mortgage. That's what it was. One in six mortgages was held by countrywide mortgage. And, um, and then of course we had the mortgage crisis going on and things were going so bad that the, um, the thing that Warren Buffett ended up doing was that he offered Bank of America, I think had lent $13 million, $13 billion to um, uh, Countrywide and I think was looking to buy Countrywide. And uh, at that point they were saying the only possible person that could bail them out was the government. And then of course Warren Buffett approached uh, the government and said, listen, instead of you guys bailing them out, I will bail them out, but you need to give me X amount of tax credits. Long story short, so that was that whole mess when Bank of America acquired Countrywide, they became one. Warren Buffett, of course, basically is a majority stock holder of, basically he lent the money um, to Bank of America so that the government didn't have to do the bailout. He basically bailed them out and the rest is history. So those were really, that was a time of great financial calamity for a lot of people. So here it is not even 30 days, it's the following month. That was August, so this is now September. The stock market was crazy then too. So their launch coincided with this global financial crisis and the financial institutions around the world were facing cataclysmic losses while families and individuals lost their savings, assets and livelihoods in the worst downturn since the Great Depression. It really was. Knock on wood, I still did okay, but it was, it was, uh, it was chaos. It was mayhem, the dealing with the public and all the, I mean, my investors did phenomenal and a lot of homeowners did not do well. So meanwhile, Glenn and Natalie were facing their own financial crisis and hardship by launching their business. They had racked up $120,000 in debt and and it was in credit card debt. And if they failed, if the business failed, they'd lose everything, their home, their cars, investments, in addition to be buried under an insurmountable amount of debt. So on the morning of their launch, unbeknownst to them, their email delivery system was down for scheduled maintenance. So none of their customers received confirmation emails for their purchase. So by lunchtime, they had already received thousands of customer support email complaints in addition to challenges with their online bank. The bank wanted to freeze their account due to unusual activity. They had been experiencing the most memorable day of their lives. So in the first hour, on the first day, they had hit the $100,000 mark and by the day's end, they grossed $288,000. So in the end, Glenn and Natalie ended up generating $700,000 based on a $97 program with no upsells, but the story doesn't end there. They were of course delighted with their achievement, but they faced one last monumental challenge because of the volatile and uncertain financial climate. At the time, their bank froze their account. So because of the volatile and uncertain financial climate at the time, their bank froze their account so they couldn't access the money. This meant they couldn't pay commissions to their affiliates or the $120,000 they owed to creditors or deliver profit sharing to the people who had helped them launch the business. Everything hinged on their funds being released. Finally, after six months of sticking to their vision and watching their mind movie, they gained access to their account lifting the financial burden that had nearly sent them into bankruptcy. But here's where the story gets really good. As the world was still reeling economically, the value of the US dollar against the Australian dollar was grossly different. So thanks to the exchange rate, 
when they transferred their money back to Australia, they ended up earning an extra $250,000. So with that, as well as the commissions that they received in exchange for promoting partner affiliate programs, Glenn and Natalie actually met their million dollar goal. Isn't that cool? The, they credit a huge part of their success, which was the complete opposite of what everyone else in the world has experienced with the fact that they focused on their mind movie every single day. And while this is a great example of the potential of mind movies, and while the options to create your own mind movie are endless, the process is relatively the same. Students first pick their song, one they will never tire of listening, and next they choose images or videos of either themselves or a future event and lay them out sequentially to tell a story of what their future looks like. Finally, we ask them to come up with specific words, phrases, or affirmations to add to the scenes which they superimpose over the images in the exact same way that TV commercials program people to be victims or to experience want and lack. So mind movies can now program students to be unlimited in a life they are capable of creating. Isn't this brilliant? So in our advanced workshops, our students watch the kaleidoscope video before they watch the mind movies. So in our advanced workshops, in our, in our advanced workshops, our students watch the kaleidoscope video before they watch their mind movies because it helps them induce and sustain alpha states and theta trans states with their eyes open, opening that doorway between the conscious and the subconscious mind. So throughout their meditation, while in an alpha or theta brainwave state, they are more suggestible to their own reprogramming process. So this is important because the more suggestible they are while using the mind movie, the less likely they are to become analytical and have constant internal thoughts such as, how is this going to happen? Or this is impossible. Or how am I going to afford that? Or it didn't happen last time, so why should it happen now? While the kaleidoscope induces students into trance to open the subconscious to programming, the mind movie is the new program. Mind movies program our students' subconscious minds the same way that television commercials program us, but in more positive, unlimited, and constructive ways. So when our brain's thoughts are silenced, the conscious mind is no longer analyzing incoming information. So as a result, whatever information we are exposed to in this state encodes directly into the subconscious mind. So just like recording or videotaping something to be automatically played back later, we're recording a new program in the subconscious mind. So a great amount of research over the years has documented how the right and left hemispheres of the brain and neocortex relate to one another. So we now know that the right hemisphere processes spatial, nonlinear, abstract, and creative thinking, while the left hemisphere is logical, rational, and linear, methodical, and mathematical thinking. So the latest research, however, also suggests that the right hemisphere processes cognitive novelty, and the left hemisphere processes cognitive routine. So this means that when we learn new things, the right hemisphere is more active. And when, we be, when new learnings become routine, then they're stored in the left hemisphere of the brain. So the majority of people operate from the left hemisphere of their brain because they're hardwired into automatic programs and habits that they've memorized. So this is why language is stored in the left hemisphere. It's routine. You can think about the right hemisphere as the territory of the unknown. 
and the left hemisphere as the territory of the known. It makes sense then that the right hemisphere would be romantic, creative, and nonlinear, while the left hemisphere would be methodical, logical, and structured. We've actually seen this dual processing occurring while watching our students' brain scans in real time. I wish I could be there to see the brain scans being measured right as you know these meditations are taking place. I mean, it's cool to be in the room and doing the meditations. Make no mistakes, every time I get a chance to do that, I'm in. Um, but I think to actually see the brain scans in live time, I think that would be hot. Anyhow, a little bit of my geek coming out here. So because the kaleidoscopes flow, uh, the geometric fractal patterns within patterns does not look like anyone, anything, anywhere, at any time. Its patterns are designed to bypass the perceptual networks and associative centers of the brain that relate to, to known people things, objects, places, and times. Its ancient geometrical patterns reflect repeating patterns found throughout all of nature. Thus, they activate the lower brain centers. It's for this reason that you can't look into the kaleidoscope and see your Aunt Mary, a bicycle you owned in sixth grade, for example, or the house that you grew up in, because you're not activating or triggering that associative center that's related to memories that are primarily located on the left hemisphere of the brain. So as you stop thinking and analyzing and start moving into the alpha or theta brainwave patterns, more activity is occurring on your right side. And if the left hemisphere operates in the known, then the right hemisphere operates in the unknown. It's the creative. It's like that blank canvas where you can create anything. And as activity increases in your right hemisphere, you are more open to creating something known, unknown, and new. So look at graphics 9A1 and 9A2 in the color insert shown, showing brain scans of two students who are in coherent alpha and theta state. In graphic 9A3, you'll see another student's entire brain in theta while viewing the kaleidoscope. And if you look at graphic 9A4, it shows the brain scan of a student watching the kaleidoscope. The right side of the brain is more active while they engage in the novelty of the experience during a trans state. So when we play the kaleidoscope in our advanced workshops, we play it in a dark room. So the melatonin levels increase, thereby enhancing brain wave changes. So I ask students to relax and constantly slow down their breathing. As their respiration slows down, so do their brain waves. Moving from beta to alpha, I then ask them to continuously relax themselves into their body and to get ever more in touch with it. And I want to get them into a state somewhere between half awake and half asleep when they're most suggestible, further priming that brain to accept the programming of their mind movie. So just as late night infomercials influence people because of production of melatonin in preparation for the restorative.